Well, hello guys. Uh, welcome back for another week and lecture and all of that fun here in ethics. Uh, I hope everybody is doing well, um, maintaining with your social distancing and everything. Uh, the news, the social medias, and everything else is getting pretty wild. And uh, I know that we were recently extended through the end of April, at least in terms of what uh, the state of Ohio, our governor, etc., have recommended and maybe enforced. Um, some of you, this might be a shock. Others kind of saw it coming. Um, and so I hope that you guys uh, have the stuff set in place. And if not, please reach out to me. Um, you know, I'm here for your mental and emotional health as much as I can be, as, as everything else. Um, I do care about that, guys. Not just, hey, do the work. Let's, you know, what can we be together for each other? Um, so, yeah, if it's in the YouTube comments, if it's via email, um, if, if you need something more than that, I can give out my, my number, but I, I try to keep that restricted. Um, but I am available. Uh, reach out to Cindy, uh, uh, Mrs. Putman, um, uh, whoever else that you guys have in contact. But, you know, I recommend that you have a schedule, a routine, that you begin to follow that. Uh, I do for my own schoolwork and this class. Um, I will be grading your papers very soon. So uh, hopefully this gets posted on Monday and I think your papers are due then uh, Monday by Monday evening. So get those in. Um, if I screwed something up on the box, on the Dropbox, let me know. Uh, but I'll try to get those, especially the early birds graded and the feedback to you so we can get that turned around. Uh, this week, we are going to be looking at its chapter 19, chapter 19 on war, political violence, war, terrorism, and torture. So, yay! Fun stuff! Um, and for the homework this week, I want something a little bit different. Uh, I want us to look at the discussion questions, but I don't want to overburden you by giving you all of them. So... Here's the deal. Pick the ones you like and give me a full page. Uh, just like same format as your paper, double spaced. Um, you know, if you take up the first three inches with just your name and the class and all that other BS, then, you know, add a little extra to the tail end, go to a page and a half. Um, but a full page on at whatever question or questions you want. If you answer one and you've got a full page, then you're done. If you answer one and it's half a page, then pick a second question and go until you've got a full page of writing on any of the discussion questions. That's pages 722 to 723 in your textbook. I'll, I'll have that all written out, but uh, I wanted to just define that a little better here. Um, so... However many questions it takes, if it's one, if it's ten, as long as you get a full page of thoughtful response, then I'm happy. So, um, you know, Times, New Roman, whatever font, um, keep it at 12 point, same format as the papers, but uh, yeah, just a full page should, should suffice to give thoughtful reflection to whatever, you know, so have fun with that. Pick pick your favorite question or questions out of those, uh, I think it's 10, yep, 10 discussion questions, and, and we'll be good. Um, and remember, again, the discussion board or these assignments, these questions, they count as your attendance, so it's double whammy uh, if you don't do it. So, with that, we are going to move on to our lecture on war. Uh, and for this one, this is one of the few lectures that I actually have a PowerPoint for, and I figured out how to do it with the software that I'm using. So let us switch over to that now.
There it is. Yay. Um, I will upload this in both PowerPoint and uh, link it for Google Slides. I uploaded it there as well. So whatever works for you guys, um, hopefully one of those will. Uh, if not, just watch the video again. Uh, most of this, a lot of this information is in the textbook, but I know a lot of us like to have that reinforced through lecture. So yeah, war, what is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. I uh, do not make me sing James Brown, right? No, let's not do that. So when it comes to war, the central question the main question, in terms of ethics at least, is when, if ever, is war morally justifiable? That is, when is it okay, permissible, to, for a nation, for a country, state, whatever, to go to war? What are the conditions, and how do we determine that? And throughout the years, there have been many who have tried to figure out what that looks like. And at different times, that has obviously changed and evolved. Uh, in ancient times, it was simply, you know, because you could. Because the people over there had something you wanted, and you thought you had the ability to go take it. Um or you had to defend yourself from such an invasion or raid or something like that. But as society changed, as the world changed, as technology changed, these questions have changed and we have become uh, much more aware of the devastating consequences of war. And, and so how do we how do we answer that? We live in a democracy. Theoretically, a representative representative, yes, there we go. Let's try it again. Representative a constitutional republic. We elect people. And if they make decisions we don't like, we replace them. So, when we talk about war, what, what do we mean? Well, in terms of this lecture, at least, we, we generally are talking about a state. And when I say state, I mean the, 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 the old school term, not like Ohio versus Michigan. Although, those of you that have taken U.S. history might note that the, United, that the states of Ohio and Michigan did declare war on each other at one point in time, way, 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 way back, uh, over the, the border as to where that line should be. Both states sent armies to fight each other, but both armies, both Michigan and Ohio, they got lost. And they missed each other. And they wandered around the wilderness of northwestern Ohio, southern Michigan for a while, and then they decided, well, we can't find them. I guess we'll go home. And that was the end of it. So, but when I say state, we mean something more along the lines of a country, uh, government and its territory. So, uh, you know, state, nation, those, those have different connotations and different meanings. But... So yeah, generally it is a state or a group that decides to fight against another group. And in ages past, you know, while considerable resources were put towards it, it wasn't always a total country effort. You sent the people, you sent you sent your warriors, your young men to go fight. And everything back home kind of stayed as it was, unless you got invaded. With World War I, that, that changed. And we got a new definition called Total War, in which everything about the, that country's 
economy and agriculture and everything was all pitched into the war effort. You know, uh, during World War One and World War II, you know, the president told Chrysler, General Motors, Ford, hey, you guys are going to stop building cars and start building tanks and planes and jeeps and other things. All of the farming was subsidized and in a different way to help supply not just our soldiers, but our allies. We started sending massive food to Britain. And so everything changes. And, and the government took much more control of the economy during that wartime effort. So, you know, when we say war what what do we mean and now in our modern world as a consequence of the attacks of september 11th that changed it no longer was a state country versus another country it was theoretically an alliance of countries against a, a multinational terrorist network that may have been supported by a few governments, but was not a, an official government army. How do you fight that kind of war? We literally rewrote the rules for good and bad to fight that kind of war. So, few more elements here. Of course, war can be physical. You know, we tanks, planes, bombs, guns, bullets, swords. Psychological warfare is a an ancient tool. It is nothing new. Uh, it is one that, you know, can be employed very effectively. Uh, I forget which dictator it was. I want to say in Nicaragua uh, in the 1980s, the United States wanted to kick him out, but he was in his very heavily fortified fortress, and we didn't want to, you know, have our young men dying in another jungle uh, after Vietnam. So instead, what we did was we surrounded the place and set up these massive speakers and just blasted ACDC and Hard Rock 24-7. Uh, during World War I and II, each side would try to use pamphlets and media to manipulate the their own people or the people on the other side. Terrorism is aimed to psychologically affect the other, your, your enemy. Terrorism. Fear. We have things like economic warfare. We have sanctions on nations like North Korea and Iran. We don't like what they're doing, so we will not do business. We don't allow our businesses here to do business in their countries. We strangle them economically as a way of exerting pressure. You guys are probably familiar with cyber warfare and hacking, and that can be, you know, direct attacks like uh, the Russian KGB trying to get secrets from the CIA. It can be soft attacks. It can be... Mm, you know, these underground shadow groups that are just trying to steal your information. As our infrastructure and utilities become more intelligent, more online, they also become more vulnerable. Yes, we could use um, computer networks to better distribute electricity throughout Ohio. But when all of that is connected, then it is vulnerable to a hacker who could suddenly turn off or turn on the lights. Uh, you guys are a little young to 
have lived through, but I certainly did live through the Cold War. Uh, from the end of World War II until 1991, the United States and the USSR, uh, what you know, Russia and all of its extra little countries it ab absorbed, were in a race, an arms race. Each side had nuclear weapons. Each side was building better and better jets and tanks and submarines, trying to find a way to, to one-up the other side. But they never, we never fought overtly. There were proxy wars like Korea and Vietnam, but we didn't duke it out, the U.S. versus Russia. That's what it made it a cold war. Now we have things like the war on drugs, the war on poverty, and of course the war on disease. Tres or, yeah, yeah. President Trump uh, said that he is a wartime president now, and there is some truth to that. We are on a kind of war footing and mentality at this moment. So, is that the same thing as a physical war? No, but it does bear some similarities in the way that we allow the government to take a little extra control of our lives so that we can hopefully find some way of preserving life. Let's move on. There are three big views on warfare. And I have them here on this slide in a kind of, uh, on a continuum. I, I love my visual representations. And, and on one side, the left, is pacifism which says that war is never justifiable. On the other end, you have realism, which says that, no, there, there, there are no rules. War is just more or less beneficial to the state, but let's keep morality and ethics out of it. And then somewhere in the middle is what we call the just war theory. And that doesn't mean, hey, just have war. No, it, it means what is a justifiable war? What is a morally permissible warfare? And what does that look like? So, yes, again, pacifism, war is never permissible. There are groups in our country, in many countries, in many places, that, that believe that war is always a fundamental violation of human rights, of ethics, of morality. It represents a failure of diplomacy, of statesmanship, of, well, just basic human decency. Um, and you can look at it from both a, a couple of the our moral theories so far. You know, if you are a utilitarian, you could say that war always produces more harm than good. Look at the lives lost. Is it ever really worth it? Even World War II. Massive, massive loss of life on both sides. If you are a Kantian or a natural law somewhere on the non-consequentialist side, you would and a pacifist, you would say something like war is always a violation of fundamental human rights, like the right to life. You know, uh, we fight and win wars by killing the other side. Uh, the realist, though, on the, the far end of that spectrum, says that war is not immoral. In fact, that morality has no place. All is fair in love and war. Um, you know, it just, what will it gain us? It's a very cold utilitarian calculus. Hey, they have oil. Let's go get it. Lower our gas prices. And this pick camp comes from some video game I don't even remember, but I, I just love it. 
But King Wo doesn't want war. He wants peace, and he'll smash any country that disagrees. So, yeah. The consequentialist, uh, as a realist, would say it's all about the greater good. Our greater good. Our side is the only one that matters in this. Uh... And if you come at it, though, from a non-consequentialist, if you're a Kantian ethicist, you would just say it, does, it doesn't commute, compute. Uh, moral norms apply to individuals, but they do not apply to states or countries or governments. They're too big to be concerned with morality. Yeah, I think, I think we, that would be a problem, right? So... What, what what can we do? Is there a third way? Is there a middle ground? And, and that's where just war theory comes in. That war can be permissible, but only under certain very narrow conditions. That is, you know, how we define it. Uh, let's not just go willy-nilly or for whatever reason. Uh, let's try to rein this in. And the, the idea of just war theory, or at least its uh, expression, that is, comes to us from our old friend Thomas Aquinas, St. Tommy. Uh, in fact, one of the popes wanted him to write this to justify uh, their own wars. Fun fact that you guys might not know is that the Catholic Church still has its own army. Um, Right now, they're just relegated to defending the Vatican. Uh, but back in the day, in Tommy's day, uh, they had a big army. This was the Pope's own Catholic army, in addition to the army of what was called the Holy Roman Empire and other Christian monarchs. Uh, you know, they all had their own standing armies. So how do we work this stuff out, guys? How do we justify things like the Crusades or war against between Catholics, two different Catholic kingdoms? Again, Catholicism was the only game in town. But, you know, a couple hundred years later, the Protestant Revolution started. Can we fight Catholic versus Christian or rather Protestant versus Catholic? Um, sorry, both are Christian. So yeah, how do we justify that? And so Thomas Aquinas came up with two categories. The first is the jus ad bellum, which again, Latin, I know, but it means the justice of war. When is it permissible to declare war, to go to war? The other category is the jus in bello, that is the justice in war. Once it's started, how should war be conducted? What are the uh, rules of combat, uh, the rules of engagement? Right? Okay. So for each of these categories, uh, Tommy, St. Thomas Aquinas had several rules. Um, and different books and different authors divide and number these in different ways, but uh, our esteemed Professor Vaughn um, gives us six of the ad bellums and four of the in bellows. And yes, this kind of stuff will be on the final. I guarantee it. So, what are the rules of war? When can we declare war? The jus ad bellum. Well, the first thing is that the cause must be just. And so I call it just cause. And that doesn't mean, well, just cause. No, it means, you know, there, there, there needs to be a good reason. Which again, criticism. Hey, Tommy, this is the question we're trying to answer. What is a justifiable cause? Uh, essentially, it boils down to this. That a state... A government really has no right to instigate a war. Uh, probably many of you have had a father or grandfather or uncle say something like, 
You don't start the fight, but by God, you better finish it. Okay, that's the same principle here. Uh, you, don't, you don't have a right to start it. But you do have a right to defend yourself, and we'll get to that later. To defend others? Uh, in the 90s, Saddam Hussein in Iraq invaded tiny little Kuwait, just to their south. Uh, Kuwait is, was an ally of ours because, you know, they had oil and gas, and we liked it. And when they got invaded, they asked for help, and we rolled in. What about converting the infidel? That was a major justification for the Crusades, which, if you don't know much, but during the Middle Ages, at uh, certain times, popes and other kings decided to retake Jerusalem because uh, Muslim armies had taken over this city. It was important to both Jews and Christians and Muslims. So, you know, they decided to try to take it back. What about a preemptive war? That was the question after September 11th. Uh, we believed, or at least our uh, leaders told us, that Saddam, again, uh, was going to start something. And in this age of weapons of mass destruction, can you wait for the other side to punch first? I'll be using a, you know, the kind of bar fight analogy a lot. But, you know, I, uh, that's a good question. Should we wait until the other side starts dropping gas bombs or nuclear weapons or something horrible? Or can we go in and hit them first before they hit us or one of our allies. Unfortunately, after 10 and now 20 years, uh, whoops, uh, Iraq didn't really have any weapons of mass destruction, but uh, since we're here, we'll give you democracy. So, yeah. Okay, whoa, we skipped one. Rule number two is that the war must be sanctioned by proper authority. Now, what that means has certainly changed since Tommy's day, but basically, on one level, an individual cannot declare war. I, Ryan Hale, cannot declare war on Canada. You know, I see them up there across the border. Oh, they're up north. They think they're better than us. They're above us. Going about their hoose on their moose, Playing their hockey, eh? You know? Mm, Got to go get those can Canadians. Well, hmm. What about a corporation? I think I read somewhere at one point uh, Pepsi had the largest Navy fleet. Because Russia paid them in boats so that they could get some pop in their country. But in places like uh, the northwest coast of Africa, companies like Shell and BP have oil rigs and oil drilling operations. And a terrorist organization rolls up and wants to take it over. Can they fight back? Can a corporation declare war? In Thomas Aquinas' day, they believed in a thing called divine sovereignty, divine right, that only the nobility could be king. The American and French revolutions were considered by many to be absolute heresy because only, you know, God determines who is the king, and, and that is determined by, you know, you have a kid, and then that kid grows up to be the king generally a male heir. So, 
You know, that's not up to voting and the people. That's up to God. You can't. Right? But the American Revolution, we told our King George, by the way, we were still a, a colony of Great Britain, the British Empire, we told him to kiss off. Or how about during the Civil War? Did the Confederacy make themselves a proper authority? What makes a proper authority a proper authority? Nowadays, we say it would have to be sanctioned by the people, uh, the, the duly elected government, right? And what about a terrorist organization like Al-Qaeda? They certainly believe that they are in the right. It's a good question. Number three that a war should be fought with the right intentions. That is, not for bloodlust or greed or the expansion of an empire or ethnic hatred, but as Aquinas put it, the advancement of good and the avoidance of evil. Noble sentiment. You know, but... How do we define good here? During America's expansion to the West, we had this little thing called manifest destiny, that God is on our side and we as Americans need to expand across the continent from ocean to ocean and bring Christianity and, and religion and God to those savages, those Indians. Oh, we'll let them live on some little reservations, but the rest of us, it's, it's for us. Well, us white people anyway. Hitler said that Germany was too small and needed to expand, that that was good. Remember. No one ever sees themselves as the bad guy. Osama bin Laden believed that he was a righteous warrior of God, or at least convinced others of that. When George W. Bush stood on the wreckage of the Twin Towers in New York City. Our nation cheered when he said that we would be seeing those organizations, those who instigated those horrible attacks soon. Right? Ending terrorism is a good and noble goal. We'll get to the means in a bit. Number four, that armed conflict should be a last resort. That we need to exhaust all peaceful means first, whether that is diplomacy, economic pressure and sanctions, world opinion. You know, there's a process here, right? Um, indeed, before Hitler started, there were many negotiations. Um, between him and England and France and neighboring countries, you know, realizing that after World War I, maybe the uh, restrictions put on Germany were too harsh, and how do we loosen this up? And, and you know, uh, because the people were suffering, and it wasn't all their fault. And, and, and how do we work this out? And then he decided to march into Poland, and that, that changed the, the math. But, you know, should we try to reach out, diplomatically work with groups like Al-Qaeda or the Taliban? Well, 
under George W. Bush, we had this policy of we do not negotiate with terrorists. And if we draw a hard line and label some people or groups or organizations as terrorists, and then say that diplomacy is off the table for them, well, that only leaves us with one option. Number five, the good resulting from war should be proportional to the bad. We saw this as his fourth rule under uh, the doctrine of double effect. So here is the same principle again, or we might call it utilitarianism now, that at the end of the day, once it's all done, once the dust settles, there should be some gain. What does that mean, right? Well, it means that we rebuild. In fact, America invested in the rebuilding of Germany and Japan after World War II. South Korea, after that conflict, which really technically hasn't ended. And now Afghanistan and Iraq. We are trying, perhaps failing, to build something new and better. And number six, the final rule of when it is okay to go to war is that there must be a reasonable chance of success. Again, sounds like a great principle, but what does that mean? For example, <laughs> the American Revolution. Did we have a reasonable chance of success against Great Britain? The answer is no. We didn't have a snowball's chance in Hades. All right? The British Empire was ginormous. It was said that the sun did not set on the British Empire in the late 17 and through the late 1800s. They had the world's largest navy, army, everything. They were number one. What were we? A bunch of hillbillies with sticks an ocean away. To put it in perspective, we had to get help from France. Yeah. We had to resort to some unsavory tactics. At the start, we didn't have a chance at all. How about the war on terror? How do you define success there? Well, the answer is when all the terrorists are dead. The problem, as we have discovered, is that when you kill a terrorist, you make at least two more. It's, you know, the Hydra problem, right? For you Marvel fans. Because maybe I'm not a terrorist, but if an American sniper or drone kills my uncle, guess what? I'm going to be pretty mad at America. I might just join up if something like that happens. It's easy to radicalize a person. We've seen it happen here in America in the last 20 years. The rise of the Tea Party, the rise or resurgence of uh, neo-Nazism and these other extreme hate groups. Why? Well, economics, but that's a different lecture. All right, so that's the justice of war. Let's switch over and uh, run through the, the rules in war. Once it has started, how should war be conducted? Uh, the first principle that Tommy came up with, and there's only four rules here, so yay, is discrimination. 
And here, discrimination is a good word. And that is that we should distinguish between combatants and non-combatants, between the fighting men and civilians, right? And never intentionally, never deliberately target civilians. And that's great. You know, back in Tommy's day, you fought war by sending your army out onto the field, and the other army would send theirs to the field. And if they weren't Ohio and Michigan, they would both end up on the same field. And, you know, they run and charge at each other and stab each other until one side wins. But today, that's different. You know, during Vietnam, the enemy deliberately disguised itself to look like civilians. The Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda embed themselves in civilian areas. They hide in hospitals and schools. How do you fight then? During World War I and II, civilians became targets because the government was turning industry into the machine of war. Right? Germany would bomb English factories because those English factories were making tanks and ammunition and guns and everything else. It was part of the war effort. We would send shipments of food and supplies to Great Britain, to England, and German U-boats would attack those, those ships. One of them was the Lusitania, and they sunk it. And we said, okay, that's it, we're in. And America joined World War I. So, how do we distinguish those things? Number two is proportionality. No overkill, right? Uh, you do what you need to to win the fight, and then that's it. You stop. And that's great. But what do you do when the other side doesn't? We'll talk about Japan and other things in a bit. But yeah, you know, we don't fill the streets with rivers of blood. When World War I ended, many German soldiers refused to accept defeat because no fighting occurred on German soil. When America joined the war, Germany was already in France in the whole horrid trench warfare, and we pushed them back, but once they kind of got across the border, we stopped there. That was the job. Unfortunately, that kind of uh, annoyance amongst the German soldiers who said, hey, we don't think we lost because, you know, not all of us died. So, and in fact, one of those soldiers was a young Adolf Hitler. Number three is likewise controversial, but it says no evil means. That certain tactics and particular weapons in war are considered evil in themselves. I think maybe genocide perhaps would, would go under the previous category of overkill, right? But things like biological and chemical warfare Mustard gas and other chemical warfare agents were used a lot in World War I, and it was horrific. And going back, uh, Adolf Hitler was one of those affected. 
he recovered. He was able to get his gas mask on in time and, and was not horribly hurt by that, but he saw it firsthand. And because of that, he did not use chemical weapons in World War II, even though Germany had huge stockpiles of them. He was so affected by that that he's like, yeah, no, that's the line. Okay, he did use chemicals on Jews in the Holocaust, in the concentration camps, but... Yeah. And guess what? The United States and England and France and the other allies had huge stockpiles of gas chemical weapons as well and did not use them. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there was a big pause even among Americans who said, uh, yeah, that, that was bad. Unfortunately, rape has been a tool of war. You force the other side to submit <laughs> by that. In Thomas Aquinas' day, the crossbow was considered an evil weapon. Why? Because a single crossbow, well-placed shot, could kill a knight in plate armor. The knights were the tanks of the day, right? You know, the humongously armored, incredibly expensive to equip and train a person to fight like that. And all you needed was some peasant with a crossbow to... Other techniques like the bait and switch. You know, you send a, a, a small group out, like a little scouting group, and then when the enemy comes charging to go get them, you pull those guys back and you flank with the rest of yours. If you're going to attack a convoy... How do you do it? You see a whole line of, of the enemy, like supply trucks, you know, moving food and ammunition and maybe even troops up to the front lines. And, and you happen to be in a plane or, or you're a, a, a group of special ops soldiers. How do, you, how do you attack that convoy? Simple. First, you blow up the first truck and that makes everybody stop. Then you blow up the last truck. That way they can't turn around. And then you've got fish in a barrel. Is that okay? Are mines buried in a field? Evil in and of themselves? Or the use of snipers? It seems very unsportsmanlike, doesn't it? Yeah. I could go on on some of the tools and techniques of war, but rule number four is benevolent quarantine. That is, I love my big words, right? That is, if you take prisoners, then they must be treated humanely. You cannot abuse them, you cannot just execute them, you certainly cannot torture and starve them. We try to do that. Yes, the occasional problem does arise. During the invasion of Iraq, in a part of Operation Enduring Freedom, um... We took captive many uh, soldiers of the Iraqi army. Um, and because the rules had changed and we had more females in the army, uh, trying to figure out what should their role be. We didn't really want women on the front lines dying and stuff like that. That would make for bad headlines. So we used them as guards for these captive prisoners. Um uh, 
But in Iraq, there is a serious culture of machismo. We might call it toxic masculinity, you know, but it's a very male-dominated culture. Simply having a woman guard your male soldiers was just a massive insult. And so they decided to rub some salt in the wound. And uh, the women soldiers would have the Iraqi captives stripped down to their underwear, and then they'd point at the tidy whities and laugh. Yeah. Look at their tiny manhood, right? Pictures got leaked to the press, and uh, there was quite the kerfluffle. One of the techniques that we used are enhanced interrogation techniques, in addition to waterboarding in places like Guantanamo Bay and our other black sites, was to take the Quran and flush it in a toilet. A little psychological torture. Is that okay? Well, we said yes, because if they are terrorists, then they're not soldiers of a nation or a country. Therefore, the Geneva Conventions and regular rules don't apply to them. Literally. Uh, George Bush and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld and, and the administration wrote those rules that way. So here's the here's the the full deal uh, as kind of a review slide. Um, kind of list them out. The jus ad bellum, the rules of going to war, has to have a just cause, proper authority, right intention, last resort. The good should equal or outweigh the bad, and there should be a reasonable chance of success. And the jus in bello. Once the war has started, that we should discriminate between soldiers and civilians, proportionality, no overkill, no evil means, whatever that means, and benevolent quarantine, humane treatment of the prisoners of war. Uh, I see I'm at 52 minutes at this point, so... I'm going to end this lecture here. Uh, hopefully later this week I'll add uh, something more on uh, terrorism and torture. And uh, I'd like to do a bit on the end of World War II and, and kind of summarizing and exemplifying these points a bit more. Uh, but I think our brains and are all done at this point. So uh, make sure you read the chapter. Uh, do the homework. Again, pick whatever questions you want out of those discussion questions and give me a full page. If you answer one with a full page, you're good. If it takes you two or three, that's fine as well. Um, and, uh, you know, just intrigued, excited, you know, uh, to see your thoughts and uh, working it all out. So... Uh, stay safe, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Bye, guys.